Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How's everyone doing today? Yeah, everyone's okay? Alhamdulillah. Good, dead crowd, mashallah. So, um, I was told to talk about the transition from high school to university and what that looks like and how we can make it more uh, smooth, so to say. So, uh, I serve right now as a Muslim chaplain at University of Toronto Scarborough campus, so where Fossil is from. And I've been there for about four years now. And uh, seeing the transition of Muslim students, the way I like to see it, it's a revolving door. So students are coming into university, students are leaving university, um, some students make it halfway and then they change their entire outlook on life and they want to travel or uh, they just want to work and so on and so forth. So it's a revolving door similar to that of a madrasa or a darul ulum, so to say. Um, alhamdulillah, I had the opportunity to go and study overseas. When I came back, I had to transition from a boarding school to high school, from a high school to grad school, from grad school to becoming like a professional and working. So transitions are pretty much a huge part of my life. Today I was transitioning. Um, I went to go pick up my mom's car from the mechanic and the lady that was working there, I used to play basketball with her when I was a kid. And I'm like, yo, I was just like, and she was like, I, I know you from somewhere. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we used to play basketball. She's like, oh, you live here? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I live over there. She's like, okay, so what's with all of this? You know? Um, yeah, I used to play basketball with girls back in the days. <laughs> Interesting. Trans I wasn't like the age of Uthman. I was like younger, so it was halal at that time. Uh, I grew out of it. So transitioning is extremely important. How can we transition in very smooth, uh, in, a, in a smooth way? When you go from high school, you're pretty much, forgive me, but you're pretty much still a kid to the rest of the world, right? How can you uh, mature yourself and flourish in such a way where now you're an adult, you're expected of yourself to do certain things, but now you're also expected more from your parents. How many of us have expectations from our parents? to become a doctor, to become a lawyer, to become something or somebody. Just do something, please. You know, our parents expect us to do something with our lives, especially when they're paying so much money or they had RESP set up for so long to be able to do something with our lives. So you have this external factor of expectations. But then when you enter university and there are these huge classrooms and everyone's acting so smart and sophisticated because you have to fake it until you make it. And then you have these beautiful lavish dinners with MSA members and you have this, uh, you know, like amazing khatibs coming in for Jumu'ah ah, and you're doing this and that and you're just like, okay, now what am I supposed to be doing with my life? Like I was just chilling and playing and Fortnite and yada, yada, yada and now I got to like, got to do my stats. I got like so many textbooks. I have them in my backpack. I have a nice beautiful MacBook and then I have like beautiful pens and then I have more textbooks in my hand. So to be able to make that transition, it's not about just how you're acting through that transition, it's about what you're actually doing and what your end goal is. So the first thing I would recommend is uh, uh, your intention, checking your intention, that as Muslims of this next generation, what do we want to do in, to, in, in order to sustain the Muslim community? Right? We have this masjid, we have Masajid across the GTA. We have MSAs in every institution. Now MSA in itself is an institution, it's an Islamic institution within these secular institutions. We have chaplains on campus, we have imams on campus. So as a Muslim student, how can I be the best version of myself as a doctor, as a lawyer, as an engineer, as an accountant, in my service to the Muslim community, but my service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my end goal is serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Making a lot of money is there. Right? Going to school and becoming smart is there. Trying to accomplish yourself is there. But how can I serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by serving his community members is, should be a priority. And thereafter you have you know, different stages within that. You have at UTSC, I can speak for, you have the health and wellness center. So a lot of people, when they come to university, they're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed. They, they don't know um, how many courses to take, which courses to take, 
because they don't have mentors, they haven't read you know, certain things, they haven't uh, done their research adequately, so now they're overwhelmed because, again, the expectations of the parents, the expectations they put on themselves, um, the overwhelming course loads and so on and so forth, exams, quizzes, tests, everything just piling up one after another. University life is not easy. I don't want you to think it's easy. I don't want you to accept that it is easy. It's not easy. It's very difficult. And the whole purpose of me telling you that is to mentally prepare you that the transition from high school to university is real. It's a real transition. Because if you're not prepared mentally and you think it's easy, and you think, who cares what my high school teachers were trying to prepare me for? Who cares what they were saying? No, no, no. It's real. You have to know your English. You got to know your math. You got to know everything to be able to enter into university and prepare yourself to be able to say, I got this. I will hold this down for myself, for my family members, for everyone who wants me to do something with my life, for myself, right? So when I came back from Madrasa and I had to go to grad school, I was just like, I failed my first paper. My very first paper I failed. And then that's when all hopelessness just darkens around you. It's, you're just sunk in this black hole. And you're like, what am I thinking of going to university? Of writing this paper about something that I don't even know what I'm talking about, but it makes me sound really smart. Right? That's pretty much... I, when I look at my papers now, I'm like, I, I wrote that? Hmm. Wow. You know? But my first ever paper, I failed. And then the prof called me into the office and she was like, okay, Omar, are you really cut out for this? I'm like, excuse me? And she was like the racist one. So I just have to prove her wrong. And so my entire, like, she fueled my fire to get through grad school. And when I graduated, I was like, what are you going to say now? Like, you know, I was like, what's up? Right. And so I was able to do that because I had something fueling me. So what is your fuel? Is your fuel yourself? Is it your community? Is it your family? Is it, you know, your buddies? What is it? And to be able to find something to be able to fuel your fire. A lot of people go through psychological issues, depression, severe anxiety disorders uh, when they enter into university. Um, at times, that severe anxiety can lead to OCD and other things. Your campus has health and wellness centers to be able to take care of that. So don't be scared to say, it's okay, I'm going through something right now, I need somebody to talk to. If you have an imam on campus, speak to them. If you have MSA mentors on campus and you feel comfortable, speak with them. But you have a health and, health and wellness center where you have counselors, you have psychologists, you have psychiatrists to be able to go into their safe space and talk to them, right? And then you have uh, your academic advisory committee and your counselors there to be able to have those conversations with on to how to navigate which courses to take and so on and so forth. Right, so you have communities within these communities. So not all the time they're going to be brown Muslims, and they shouldn't be. There should be diverse Muslims. You should have your Arabs, your Somalis, your Browns, everyone. Muslims are Muslims at the end of the day, right? And so you have these communities, these pockets of individuals that are helping you because community building lowers your anxiety levels. It lowers your anxiety levels. So take part in these community initiatives. Take part in these halaqas, these classes that are going on. Take part in... Um, different initiatives on campus, whether they're Islamic or whether they're secular, but to be able to build bridges between the two. Because a lot of times we, I, I have a few students that come to UTSC and they study the Alim program with someone. And so they study the Alim program and then you're seeing them walk in with their Arabic books and their Urdu books into university. And I'm like, so how's class going? They're like, ah, oh, it's whatever. Like we're focusing on what's going to help us in the hereafter. And I'm like, cool, what's going to help you right now? Like, okay, your Arabic and your Urdu is going to help you, fine, your your sarf, your, your fiqh, cool, great. But you, if you're here and you're paying for this, being able to value the worth of the education, because you're paying a lot of money, and you're getting a lot of grants, and people are investing in you to be able to get you a really good education, and develop your education to that level. So when, you, when you're exercising your priorities, that you have health sciences or whatever program you're taking and then you have whatever else you're doing but not letting go of your family a lot of people when we enter university we focus on a heavy course load 
taking five courses a semester, six courses a semester, and then we're just like, we have no time for anybody else. And that's not how the transition will be smooth. That's not how the transition takes place. What I did initially was I took a light course, I took three courses, and then I built up three, four, five, until I knew how to manage all of that. So sometimes, if my course was two years or three years, I extended it a couple of semesters because you have to learn how to manage your time and learn how to manage the workload that comes. Because when you're going from high school to university, it could be extremely difficult in recognizing, okay, how much of a workload do I have? How many courses am I going to be taking? How many exams will I have this semester? And so on and so forth. What's expected of you? So to be able to transition very smoothly, start off part-time. Some people take gap years to mentally prepare themselves. I wouldn't highly recommend that, but it works for some people. Some people start off with one course, two courses, three courses, and move on. So just take your time. You know yourself best, right? But if you need somebody to talk to, you can reach out to the university, you can reach out to myself, Imam Shakir, and others, right? To be able to have, um, you know, uh, academic counseling or career counseling. But whatever works for you, self-reflection, right? And a huge part of that is self-care. What are you doing for yourself to getting your mind off of things? When I used to come home after a long day of school and the commute going to downtown and back, an hour and a half in the TTC and then with all the delays and everything else extra, how are you utilizing that time? Are you reading? Are you watching something? Are you making use of your time pretty much, right? So that time is very valuable. Now I can say, read a book, do your coursework on the subway. How realistic is it? You're drained, right? Some people read Quran, Bismillah. Whatever floats your boat, right? Whatever floats your boat. And don't feel that you're doing something wrong. Because again, it's a journey. It's a migration. It's a hijrah. A hijrah from high school to university, it's a hijrah. It's, it's huge. It's not easy. But it's possible. So like how the Prophet ﷺ left Mecca and went to Medina, your hijrah is from right now, it's from high school to university. It's difficult. Recognizing that difficulty. But how am I supposed to get to Medina and how am I supposed to live in Medina during these four or five years or however long it's going to be? And then you're going to love your academic life so much to a point, if you do it properly, that you're going to be like, I want to go to grad school. If you go to grad school, Think about your PhD, right? My PhD is at the back of my mind, inshallah, one day, but I can't do it right now. But it's still there, like the plan is still there, concrete in my mind, hopefully, inshallah. And so what we have to do as Muslim community members is recognize the need within the community. How many um, PhDs do we have? How many Muslim profs do we have which are not um, Ismaili or Ahmadi, but are Sunni Muslims, right? us Sunni Muslim students filling that void one day that you know teaching university courses whether they be in life sciences in management so on and so forth you know uh, being in positions of leadership within universities in these secular institutions having a Muslim who has a M Islamic identity but also has certain grounding within academia to be able to have those positions of leadership so recognizing all of that. How much time do I got? A lot? Okay. So how is everyone feeling right now? What difficulties do you anticipate entering into university? I think that's, that's how we have to address this, right? I might be talking about apples and you're probably thinking about oranges. So let's open the floor to having this conversation together. I, I, I don't like to talk. Let's be frank, I don't like to talk. Even at university, we have discussions. Soul food's all a discussion for me. It's like I bring up a topic and I ignite the flame and everyone's just like, you know, putting their own wood in. But what is your fear, if any, or what are your hopes for your university transition? Let's start with the brothers. Because the sisters are always pretty much shy. And we'll get to you, inshallah. Yes. Tuition costs. Mashallah. Okay, good. Yes. Living expenses, if you move away from home Okay, what else? Where are you planning to go by the way? That's like a half plan Like I'm gonna have living expenses but I don't know where I'm going Okay, what else? 
Time management. Okay. So we have three things. Living expenses, time management, and tuition costs. Tuition costs are pretty much... Okay, so I'm going to recommend each and every single one of you, if your parents are millionaires or they're not, take OSAP. Why am I saying this? I get in trouble for this a lot. Taking OSAP, you're signing an interest-bearing loan. When you sign an interest-bearing loan, there's two issues. It's, it's like signing a credit card, uh, signing up for a credit card application. When you sign up for a credit card application, what happens is that you're signing an agreement that if you do not pay your payments on time, interest will be incurred upon yourself and you're going to have to pay that interest. Correct? Similar with OSAP, you're signing this agreement, this loan, that says you're getting X amount of dollars and then six months post-grad, you have to pay X amount of dollars back in installments. If you do not pay them back, interest is occurred upon and you have to pay that interest as well. Okay? The reason why I tell everyone to get OSAP is because there's a lot of grants affiliated with OSAP that will, you will not be eligible for unless you do not apply for OSAP. So applying for OSAP is huge. I applied for OSAP, my tuition was pretty much free because all the grants knocked off all the loans. I took the loans and I invested it. I took the grants and I paid it towards the university. I'm chilling, pretty much. My university was free. Whatever loans I had, I invested and I'm doing good, alhamdulillah. Financially plan how you're gonna go through the next four years of your life, what you're gonna do with the money. A lot of people, they take that money Michael Kors bags, Jordans, uh, what is it, like Canada goose jackets. Like, yo, you hit the jackpot recently, what happened? OSAP. <laughs> That's not your money. That's not your money. That's an amana. You have to pay that back. And in four years down the line, you don't want to be like, oh, I'm zakat eligible now, can I have some money? You don't want to go through that. So plan out financially exactly what you're going to be doing with that money, how you're going to utilize it, Right? And how you're going to pay it back on time. Time management. Time management is all about scheduling. Right? Scheduling your day. Having um, a, a plan for your, for your week. What courses are you taking? How much time you're going to uh, give towards those courses? Towards the homework? Right? Um, if you're going for tutoring, putting that in. But exercising the importance around how much time you're going to be uh, giving towards your academic life, but also your family life, and yourself. yourself. You, you deserve some time. When are you going to be taking a vacation with your OSAT money? Right? Oh, if, if it's just even for a weekend to Blue Mountain or something. But you should get some time off. Right? Some people take a semester off just to get their head under everything. Because it's difficult. Right? A lot of people go through difficulties. We see, I see it on campus all the time, depression, anxiety. Why? Because we don't know how to manage our time. Right? Wake, they're up all night, and when you're up all night, and then you, you have to go to class in the morning, you can't function properly because you were up all night trying to do an essay that you should have been doing four weeks ago. So, planning your time around all of that. What else? Sisters? Anything? Yes? How do you so the question is how do you balance your school life while balancing your religion? There's no dichotomy. There's no dichotomy between the two. Right? You're a Muslim always. You're a student always. So if it comes down for sisters like their hijab and going to school, your hijab stays with you while you go to school. If it comes down to salah and you're in class or in an exam, you have um, the right to leave your exam to go pray salah and then go back to your exam, right? Your registrar knows about it. You have uh, the multi-faith services on campus to be able to have those exceptions. Um, Jumu'ah on campus. So when it comes down to balancing who you are as a Muslim and who you are as a student, there is no dichotomy or there shouldn't be. Uh, I, I, I personally didn't find any challenges within it when I went to university. Yes, you have a lot of fitan, you have a lot of trials, you have a lot of things that can steer you away and distract you from being a Muslim or your Islamic values. 100% you have that. But are you reflecting upon it? 
Are you doing your dhikr on your way to school, on your way back? Right? Are you actually remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How proactive are you in your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? And, and I think that's what it is. If you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala walking, He comes to you running. And I think we always have to take that first step in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, this university is going to be difficult. Yes, post-grad is extremely difficult. 100%. And who can make that easy? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rabbi yassir wa la tu'asir. Oh Allah, make it easy for me and not make it difficult for me. But understanding all this cognitively, to be able to reframe that in your head, that I am not getting through this myself. Allah allowed me to get this far. He got me accepted into whatever university I got accepted into. Now I got to take that extra step towards Allah for Allah to get me through all of this. Right? Does that help? Anything else? Yes. How do you deal with failure? Just the way I did. Find some fuel to the fire. Um, don't give up. Right? It's very easy to give up. A lot of students want to give up and they say, okay, you know, um, there's a lot going on. I can't handle it. I suffered academic probation. You have unlimited avenues in university to be able to get you out of all of that. You have, let's say, um, I don't know if you know this, but you have, if you go to the health and wellness center and you say, okay, I wasn't performing to the best of my ability, my functioning was affected, can you help me? Can you write a letter for me? They'll write a letter for you. So, getting out of that slump. But you have to take, again, you have to take the first step. You have to be able to sit down, collect yourself, collect your thoughts, not work under emotions. And I tell students all the time, put a chart down, right? A line chart. On one side have the pros and one side have the cons. For everything pretty much that you're making a decision for. How am I going to do this? Right? Do I want to quit university now in my first year? Or do I, I can still raise my GPA? How can I raise my GPA? If I do, what are the pros? If I don't, what are the cons? So you're able to, see, like, you have it in front of you, you're able to see it. Um, and, and you can pick that up look at it and say, okay, no, I want to I wanna go through this, inshallah, yes. Okay, so I have two questions. What exactly is GPA? That's my first question. What exactly is GPA? Fossil, what exactly is GPA? Your grade point average. Your grade point average is pretty much, so uh, 4.0 is the highest, and then you have like zero is the lowest. Um, so you're, aim you're aiming for a 4.0 all the time. When you enter university, you're going to go onto your university portal and you're going to be seeing how your academic marks translate into your grade point average. So uh, you're going to have your sessional average for uh, the session, you're going to have your semestral average for the semester, and then you're going to have your entire program's average. Um, and so you can always raise it to 4.0. Not like always, but you can as, as much as you can. Yes. Any other questions? In the corner, yes. Start right now. Start right here. And the, the number one thing to be able to help you start is your intention. I intend to start being a better Muslim right now. Right? Why, why don't we all do that? Let's raise our hand. Let's raise our hand right here, right now. And let's make a promise and an oath to ourselves that I want to be a better Muslim from now on. Our past does not define our future. Today should be better than yesterday, and tomorrow should be better than today. And that's how a Muslim lives their life. So if I prayed three salah yesterday, today I should be praying four, tomorrow I should be praying five, and it should just continue like that. You should add your sunnah, your nawafil, and so on and so forth. But we should always have that presence, that we're living in the present better than yesterday, and tomorrow is going to be better than today. Does that help? Like you just have to ground yourself in that intention. And then once you make that intention, you constantly ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to make this path easy for you. Because when you come closer to Allah, the devil works harder on you. The closer you get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the harder it becomes for you because shaitan's whispering in your ear. And shaitan's trying to get you off the path. 
So that's why اهدنا الصراط المستقيم is extremely important because you have to constantly ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to maintain you on that صراط المستقيم, on that straight path. Yes? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. No, university is not for everyone. Yeah. No, I agree 100%. So don't feel expected. Uh, do, do I have any tips for high school students that are not sure if they want to go to university um, with all the expectations and things like that? Uh, a lot of students aren't... University isn't for everyone. And this whole elitist, uh, privileged group that... Pretty much they go to university and they feel some type of privilege or they feel like they're elite. It's, it's, it's wrong. Sometimes you can graduate with a degree and you won't find a job for the longest time. Right? So there's nothing special about going to university. Straight up. Right? A lot of people go to college, they go into trades and they're making six figures and that's just how it is. It's the stigma within society that uh, wants our older generation, the parents, to say, okay, uh, son, okay, daughter, uh, go to university, get yourself an education. You can get yourself an education anywhere. The most important thing is getting yourself an education. Because as, as, especially as Muslims, we have to be increasing in knowledge always. Whether it's your Islamic education, whether it's secular education, whether you're uh, receiving an education in a masjid, whether it's a college, whether it's a university, but find your niche, find what you're interested in. And I highly recommend a lot of people get involved in university programs um, within the first six to eight months. They realize this this sucks. Like I don't like this. I, I hate it. But I'm doing it because somebody else wants me to do it. Don't do it. Do what you're interested in. If you're interested in in, in, in becoming a pilot, go for it. In aero aero mechanics, go into that. Whatever you're interested in. Find that I, Me, I want to go to George Brown Culinary School Legit, like I want to become a chef I really do, I still do I can't What's a sheikh doing becoming like a chef? Like, You know what I'm saying? But you know, I watch Master Chef and Gordon Ramsay I cook out, I taught my wife how to cut onions Like, Legit So, you know like nowadays A lot of girls, their moms don't teach them About cooking and stuff But so I had to teach my wife Anyway, sisters, forgive me uh, But that's how it is I, I want to go to George Brown And you should follow your passions I was with, uh, I don't know if you guys know him Sidi Osama Cannon from California And I had a meeting with him May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him a long life And keep him healthy He's uh, been diagnosed with ALS he, uh, he, he was asking me about chaplaincy And working as a chaplain at university And he asked me, do you enjoy it? And I said, yeah he was like, if there was something else that you could be doing right now instead of university chaplaincy, what would it be? I said, I'd be in culinary school. He said, go for it. Just, just, just drop everything and go for it. And I never listened to him. <laughs> I just, I, I can't pull myself to do it. I'm not, I'm not that strong. If I'm, I'm married, I have kids, um, I'm working, I have income coming in, I can't just drop everything and go to culinary school. But right now, maybe some of you, you're in that position where you're still living with your parents, um, you're being financially assisted. You can drop whatever you're doing and fulfill your passion. And what is your passion? Figuring it out and then going for it. Because if you do what you love, you love what you do. Right? And it's, it's just as simple as that. And that's when you become the best at what you do, inshallah. Any other? Yes. Nothing guarantees you a job. Yeah, but like more like, you know what I mean? Like, but why can't you have both? Is my question, and that's what, like, an academic counseling session would help you figure out that you have your passion, and you obviously you want to take that passion and make money from it as well, sustain yourself. And how can you do that? Like, if you guys are trying to get to the NBA and you guys are like five feet tall, like, be realistic. 
it's not going to happen. Like that was me when I was like 10 years old. And then I just realized I'm not growing anymore, so forget about it. Right? You have to like set some realistic expectations for yourself. Anything else? Yes. Why does your GPA matter? Honestly, when you have the degree, it doesn't matter. While you're in university, it matters a lot. It matters a lot in terms of getting positions to volunteer, getting placement positions. Um, it matters in terms of uh, your, your responsibilities, your examinations. Um, sometimes you can't, there are certain elitist courses that you can't enroll into if you have a low GPA. Um, and it, for yourself, it matters because you could have done so much better, right? Yes. Yeah, if you're going for your master's, if you're going to grad school, if you're going to professional school afterwards, you need to have a higher GPA. Yeah, very rarely. Yeah. Yes. So I work as a Muslim chaplain. Uh, we have an organization known as the Muslim Chaplaincy of Toronto, um, where we have chaplains at uh, the Ryerson University, uh, chaplain at University of Toronto St. George campus, and myself at the Scarborough campus, University of Toronto. Uh, chaplains pretty much provide spiritual support to students on campus. So Fossil mentioned we had about 12,500 uh, 12, students on campus at university. 25% is Muslim, or are Muslim. And so you have individuals suffering from anxiety, from depression, um, students that don't know how to pray Salah, that want to learn how to pray Salah. Students that are Muslim, but they don't know much about their deen that want to find out, okay, um, what does it mean to have one God, or, what, or why are angels important or significant in this religion? Um, tell me what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, just being there as, you, a lot of times what happens is when we get so engrossed into academia, you lose a connection with the masjid. And this is why I want to give it up to you all, all of you for coming out to the masjid today. Having a relationship with the masjid is extremely important. When you get to university or a lot of university students do not have relationship with masajid. They don't. And so taking a chaplain to the university campus is pretty much taking the, the masjid and all of its services to the university campus to be able to provide that for the students. So you have salah taking place on campus. You have jumu'ah taking place on campus. You have counseling sessions. You have uh, the chaplain being a liaison between the university administration and the Muslim students. So for example, if you want more halal food options, or we have uh, a building that's pretty far away, the, the gym, the Pan Am Center on Morningside, uh, to provide halal food options there. So they'll call me in for a meeting. Um, if there's like Shia, Sunni, Muslim student conflict, like it's in Iraq, but it happens in Scarborough campus, to call me in and be like, okay, let's sort this out. Let's have a meeting. Um, things like that. So there's, it's pretty crazy. No, it uh, things happen. Yeah. Yes. Um, like for like people who happened. Like, sorry, things happened. Yeah. yeah. So again, it depends on what program. So sorry, the question is, if a person wants to study Islam, but also wants to study in uh, a secular institution, um, how would they be able to manage and balance both? So again, it depends on what program you're interested in, but I'd highly recommend doing a, a joint program. So uh, balancing both of them. So as you're progressing in academia, you're progressing as a, uh, as a student of the Islamic sciences as well. Um, there are options in Toronto available. I know with like Al Khalil Academy, they have a part time Alimiya program. Imam Shakir teaches something in Oshawa uh, for everyone in the East End. So, to be able to, those are like evening time classes as well. So, to be able to learn Arabic, fiqh, hadith, um, and then again part time and then do your university studies in the morning. To be able to balance both of that. Keep yourself busy. A lot of the times, what we happens is. We think, we, we, we think we're busy, right? We're taking four courses and we have a lot of spare time. So we're watching like 13 Reasons Why, Riverdale, 
What else is there? Like all these shows, we're, we're Netflix and chilling. Like a lot of students even do it on campus. They'll get like themselves as a portable or one of those cubicles and they'll just be sitting there watching the show, pretending they're doing work with their notebooks and everything else. Like, don't waste your time. Use your time wisely. If you have time, this is a time where your mind is fresh and you're able to retain knowledge, right? Do something. You're at a time where you can influence others and for the positive. So uh, being able to do that, inshallah. So I guess we'll have the question answer session with um, uh, the university uh, representatives, MSA reps. Jazakumullah khair. Yes. I can't hear you. Do I have any advice on time management? Mashaka? What's going on? You're my senior. Um, advices on time management. I mentioned scheduling. I think scheduling is one of the biggest things. It helps me out and it helps a lot of students out as well. What are you doing throughout the week? So for example, how many courses are you taking? Fill that out within your calendar. Have, um, what is it, like a register, a calendar, agenda type of thing? What are they called? You know what they're called, right? Those things, so like pulling it, managing your time by having it in front of you, filling it out. For some people, I use my Google Calendar. So I know exactly where time, place, and activity. Where, sh where should I be at this time? What I should be doing and how should I be doing it? And managing yourself that way. Um, and when you have free time, make sure you use your free time wisely for yourself. So if it, if it is Netflix, it is Netflix because a lot of people need self-care. They need to take care of themselves, get their mind off of things. When I have like a full day of counseling sessions, I'm done. Like I'm going home and I'm going to sleep because I'm, my brain is fried. My heart is like black because I've just heard like so much come at me and I'm done. Like I'm tired. Um, so I need to have like vacations quarterly. Like I need to get out, get away from everything. Um, taking walks in nature. Just to, just to be able to clear yourself. So that's how you use your free time. But that's the only time that you have around your schedule where it's not classes, not tutoring, not revision, not homework, not family time, right? And then time for yourself. And you sh at least minimum, about, I'd say 10, 10 to 15%, you should have time for yourself. But you have a schedule or agenda where you're able to input all of that to be able to set yourself. And making time, again, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, waking up for Fajr, waking Praying Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, making time for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extremely important. Um, and balancing your university life or your career, whatever it may be, uh, with your spirituality. I hope that helps, inshallah. Oh. Oh.